Hello and welcome, dear viewer, to a new video and hopefully a new series on this channel. Um, now, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of months about uh, starting a new programming language project. And the main reason is maybe that I now know enough to write a proper compiled language, like something that immediately gets compiled down to machine code. Um, you might have seen my stuff on the SOF language, um, which is interpreted, and I'm still planning to do someday to do a, a showcase of that. But I think it's time to move on. SOF was very interesting, but it's also a very strange language. And what I want to try this time is a more, I don't know, normal language, maybe. Um, something in the vein of Rust, actually. Uh, probably not as powerful, but I'll try. Um, and I'll also, also want to put in some more functional features. Um, so, yeah, I am, I'm calling that language Powder. And the way that I want to implement it is uh, very basic, actually. Um, I mean, it's it's very quick to explain, but it will be rather complicated. Uh, the idea is that Powder uses LLVM so that I don't have to fuck around with assembly. And basically, we compile Powder into the LLVM IR and um, then we can use the LLVM tools to compile that or to interpret it uh, or whatever and link it um, and so on. And uh, what I especially want to do is write the Powder compiler in Powder itself. Of course, for that, we need a bootstrap, um, a bootstrap compiler, which is basically like a first version of the compiler that implements a very basic version of the language and it can compile uh, and it can then compile the first version of the compiler that is also capable of compiling itself into LLVM and at that point, uh, or into binaries. And at that point, we can basically remove the bootstrap compiler because now we have an, an LLVM um, object thingy or even like a full binary um, that can compile the current version of the compiler and uh, can compile future versions of the compiler and we can replace that bootstrapping binary or bootstrapping LLVM IR with a new version if we uh, need have some in incompatibilities, for example, with syntax and so on. So that's that's how bootstrapping generally works. Um, that's how many bootstrap languages are implemented. You use some initial language. In most cases, it's C or C++. Uh, I don't want to torture myself, so I'm using Rust. Um, and then you try to get to the point where you can write the compiler in the language itself as quickly as possible. And from that point on, you can remove all the bootstrapping code. So um, what we'll do in the next videos is actually start writing the bootstrapping compiler. I've already done some tests. Um, there's a really nice LLVM library for Rust, which we'll have to like kind of replicate in powder <laughs> once we get to that point. Um, yeah, but today, actually, I, I won't be writing any Rust code. Today, I'll be only writing some, um, some powder code because I first want to get an idea of, um, of what the language should look like. Um, before I'm, I start to write a parser or whatever. Um, so the second video will probably be like uh, setting up a basic Rust crate and writing a parser or something. So um, I'll be, I'll hopefully be writing two um, powder um, source files today. One for um, for for, uh, for actually testing the initial versions of the compiler. So it will be really basic and will only use a couple of features that I want to have in the language uh, at the final stage. Um, and then maybe another one where I'll try out some uh, some more advanced features that I want to have later, 
um, and that other file should also be capable of being part of the standard library eventually. Um, so let's start by making a folder. What are we going to call this? I think we're going to gonna call this powder dev. Um, powder bootstrap will be the name of the rust crate so we need to reserve that name and maybe we want the name source or whatever for the actual final compiler written in powder itself once we get to that stage. Okay, so let's create a new file, which shall be called simple pw. Um, I've decided on pw as an ending because it's so obscure, nobody uses that ending yet. At least VS Code doesn't know that anyone does. Okay, so this, this file should be parsable by the parser that I'll hopefully write in the second episode. Um, so this file will have very few features. Let's start with a comment. Um, so in general, as I've said, I want to, wanted to be inspired by Rust, so I'll borrow a lot of syntax from Rust, except the syntax that I don't like about Rust. Um, but in general, it's very much uh, C-like. So like all the basics, like comments, are copied from C. Except I think I'm not going to have multi-line comments because in my experience, they're not really necessary. Uh, like modern IDEs, if you have like multiple lines of whatever, and you want to comment those out, you use your comment shortcut, which is control hash for my, uh, for my keyboard bindings. But for example, I can demonstrate that uh, with a Rust file. It's just, um, yeah, okay. Uh, the main function, I don't know. For example, if you want to comment out that function, I can just select all of it and press control hash and we'll use single line slashes to comment it out. So in my experience, uh, th that would be a job that you could easily do with multi-line comments. But in my experience in modern IDEs, with modern IDEs and stuff, you don't need that. Um, so... Uh, let's close that without saving and delete that file. Um, so yeah, that's so that's a single line comment. We should be able of um, of dealing with that in the first simple parser. Um, then let's write a main function actually. Um, I want to use the full term function for functions. Um, because I don't like the shorthands that Rust uses. Um, like sh shorthands in general, I think is very much unnecessary because code is read more than 10 times as often as it is written. So it doesn't make sense to like have you save a couple of characters. Um, if like a beginner can easily pick up what the term function means and they don't have to remember what the shorthand fn uh, means, even if that's a rather obvious shorthand. Uh, and th that, like, no abbreviations will probably be a pattern for the entire syntax. So, function main. Let's just have it as nothing. And now, maybe this syntax. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, because I want, later on, I want to have, like, a different syntax for, like, a declarative function. So, uh functions as you would have in Haskell, for example, uh, they will probably have something like this or like just an equal sign. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it's kind of unnecessary because we know that we are starting a function now. We have the arguments here. There are no arguments for now. Um, so I think we'll stick with that. So let's, let's define a variable. The starters. Uh, I'll definitely use the var key keyword because I don't like let. Um, I don't know. I just think var looks cleaner. And as with Rust, like uh, type inference, so we'll just guess the type. And if if you actually need to define the type, you'll use the colon syntax. 
which I've come to quite like from like uh, Rust and uh, TypeScript also uses that. Okay, so var var x let's say equals the integer seventy eight. Um, now we will have to. Now this integer, of course, could be of any type. Um, it could be sixteen bit, thirty two bit, sixty four bit, one hundred twenty eight bit, maybe even. Uh, so in that case, I think I'll just tell it to be a sixty four bit number. Uh, so I'll I'll try to like I'll use the Rust syntax for like. Uh, number types, which is uh, I as an integer prefix. Rust uses U for the unsigned prefix, but I always thought that unsigned was a silly name. So I'll instead use N for natural number as a prefix. So N64 is a 64-bit natural number or a 64-bit unsigned integer. Like the term unsigned integer is very much something that programmers invented. It's not something that mathematician would say. Um, yeah, okay, so that would be the um would be a very simple variable declaration. Um this would be an immutable variable and for now we'll we'll just force uh, you you to explicitly write out the type until we get type inference. Probably I'll never implement type inference in the bootstrap compiler. Um but yeah, just stick with that. And do we want something more? A print maybe I ah, know let's let's just stick to that um, okay not very spectacular but we have to start somewhere let's create the optional type here so the optional type is very fundamental because as all sensible language languages should, uh, powder will not have null or undefined or anything like that. There will be an optional type and like error result types and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's if, because in most cases you don't actually want to have null. In most cases you actually always want to have a value and optional is basically your, your opt-in thing for creating a kind of replacement for null. Uh, if you actually want to signal, okay, I might have a value here or I might not. So uh, let's start by uh, maybe just not having comment here. Let's start with uh, public. We need visibility modifiers. Let's just stick to, <laughs> this will look a lot like Java. Maybe, maybe VS Code will pick up that it's Java in a minute. Uh, I don't actually need interface here. I need... Um, okay, here's the question. Do I use the date, the keyword data or the keyword struct? Because I quite like... Like, the word struct is, is kind of a relict. And I don't like having relics in powder. Um, when there's other also intuitive terms uh, that even people that know about the relics will understand. So maybe I'll just... Well, now data is... is maybe too general. No, no, no. Data is too general if we want to have enum types. Um... Okay, maybe, maybe we could also do like something like public data uh, optional equals uh, enum and then have the enum definition here and conversely would have public struct uh, my struct equals, uh, sorry, public data my struct equals struct then the struct body maybe like this because then you could have anonymous structs, but I don't think I need that. 
Um, so. Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, this sounds like a good idea. Because then I can put this enum or struct thing on the other side of different different things. Um, like I can I can put that into. Yeah, I, if I just want to return, maybe if I have a function that just expects you to return something that implements a certain interface, uh, you can just return uh, an anonymous struct or anonymous enum that implements. Uh, that interface, um, but I guess no. In most cases, that wouldn't make sense because you would have to implement certain uh, methods. So, I guess not. I guess not. I guess let's let's go with this actually. And the same for struct, but we don't need struct here. Okay. Um, okay. Let's let's think about this. Uh, do I want the some non syntax, or do I want the just nothing syntax? Hard question. I would like both. Um, okay. Let's maybe go with. Um, with some and none. Oops. Comma. Okay, now we need the value, which is the type. Now we need generics. Okay. The kingdom optional. Let's do the T here. That's probably a good idea, I think. Maybe do I want to want brackets for the generics? Uh, no, that's harder to distinguish. I think angle brackets are good. Okay. Then let's let's maybe have like just uh, just having a method for. For testing public channel dot is some um, which returns a um, yeah so think it's a good idea to like have very orthogonal syntax so uh, let's do this uh, the, the colon for the return type as well not have like the uh, rust arrow thing I like that um, okay and so say put in a match. Oh, we actually need to take an explicit self parameter. Um, self, which is just a reference, a non mutable reference. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm thinking again about syntax, so we could just use the ampersand. I never liked the ampersand. I think it's just really arbitrary. On the other hand, I want to like use the explicit words and and or for the, the binary operators. Um, so 
I guess we don't have any. Except for, yeah. No, we have we have naming conflicts with like the bitwise operators. Um and and or except no 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 except you can just use and and or for those as well because it's um because it doesn't make sense to use like boolean logic operators on things like integers so for example if i have 30 and 40 it makes sense that i that i want a bitwise operator here and if i have true and false it makes sense that i want a non-bitwise operator here and also there's like no difference because these are at least internally like in the language logic these are one bit uh, things so bitwise and non-bitwise the dif difference there is none um so um i guess yeah i guess we don't actually need and and or for and and xor for uh for boolean and bitwise logic so i think we can just take the uh take the end um here uh, also again orthogonality like self uh, and and this reference thing is is part of the self uh, of the type of the parameter self um so I'm putting it after the colon. Um, now, normally you'd have to write something like something like this, and also I just remembered we need to have optional t here. Um, so optional t. Uh, yeah. So normally you would have to write something like this, but this is of course repetition. It's obvious what the uh, what the type will be of the self parameter, even like in a very simple version of the uh, compiler. So we can do just this. Uh, later on, I want, of course, to have this self, capital self alias for the type of the current um, object. But uh, again, we don't need that here. We can just infer it. Yeah, and I also, also, I forgot uh, this, um, which makes it rather convenient to like rename the type here if, if you actually want to you can just rename the uh the generic type so match self dot and yeah, match self right some value will be true none will be false and i'm sure later on with like um more convenient um more more neat library functions we might be able to do this uh better let's do is none self and let's just use um self that is um, and not that uh, also by the way I, for I totally forgot um, these of course use like the, the Rust syntax where you can just uh, the last expression in the function is the return value which is super neat but I just remembered like these are this is functional stuff like we, we don't need declare we don't need imperative code here we can just make this entire thing declarative which brings me to the, to the, uh, whatever you want to call it, like the functional syntax it says there's just one expression here, uh, which makes this rather neat looking. You can just do this. Um, I guess, do we want a semicolon at the end? No, I don't think so. Well, we need a semicolon because we can't tell when the... So, for example, if I have something like this, then I'd say and true or something. You couldn't tell that the function is over here. So, I guess we want a semicolon, which would be the exception. 
like no semicolons after the enum, uh, no semicolons after normal method, uh, n normal function, uh, like function, normal public function, whatever. Uh, if if you do something like that, you don't need a semicolon here, or you, you're not allowed to use a semicolon there. And also, I forgot. We need comma here. Yeah. Okay. Let's write a couple more of these. I like that. Value or self. Um. Value or default. Just a T, and that's just match self some value. Value. Oh, I guess this is like. Um, moving the value, so we actually need to take it as a moved parameter. So you, you see how this is very similar to Rust, uh, which is absolutely intentional. Okay. Okay, let's do something more complicated. Value or, and and this is the like, um, this is the more complex version because uh, it 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 takes a function actually. Um, so. Default function, um, which is of the type. Uh, before I write out the type, let me just take this and copy it down here. And also put a comma here because, like, allowing commas. Uh, in any list, like to, like allowing allowing commas after the final element in these kinds of lists, is really nice because everything looks symmetric and you can just move things around. Like if I want to move those thing two things around, I can do that without any problems. Yeah. So okay, we're we're just calling. Sound. So this needs to be. Uh, also, I totally forgot the types here. So let's use the self type alias or uh, t type alias here. Um, so let's think about like function types uh, syntax. Let's just do that separately, maybe like uh, type. type um, I don't know creator a t creator is uh, int creator we need um, we can't use the generic type parameter outside of the uh, type of course um, uh, so the int creator is a function type that maybe just function actually function sixty four I don't know let's do an adder a adder would have left hand side sixty four and a right hand side 
64. And we will force people to like name the parameters here so that it's more obvious with these uh, function type declarations what those parameters actually uh, actually mean. So essentially, like this is the yeah, this is good. This is the exact same way, except for like the missing the missing name of the function uh, that you would like declare a function itself. For example, I can now do public function add left hand side i64 right hand side i64 i64 um, left hand side plus right hand side and you see that this is the exact same thing except for like the added name here yeah okay i like this this is very orthogonal i like orthogonal languages basically where like if you know how one part of the language works one other related part of the language works in basically the same way so let's have a function t here now this will become confusing i think except it will not because Uh, because, yeah, we have identifier. I'm, I'm just thinking about parsing right now. Uh, identifier colon. Identifier colon uh, type back here. It's the type. Um, and then a comma or a closing bracket. And like if we have commas in here, like uh, something, I don't know, another T. If we have something in here, of course, this is enclosed by a bracket. So we can clearly tell that this colon, for example, doesn't belong back here, or this colon doesn't belong to like a different a different argument of this outer global method. So I think that will be fine. Yeah, that, that will be fine. Just have a function t. Yeah, okay, default function. Okay, um, can I do something more? complex like i'm always just using match here which is rather unfun because it's just very declarative I'm not using if statements while statements like all the basic stuff um and this is how you would write stuff in haskell like this is you can write all of this code in haskell straight up um no problem okay Yeah, maybe that's that's enough for now. Or let's do some. What time do we have? Oh God, I'm over half an hour. <laughs> uh no. Let's let's see. Let's let's write a vector class. Another generic type. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm writing a lot of generic types today. Um, so let's have... The vector will have a... Um, Uh, I'm just thinking about how to implement the data pointer. Well, we definitely need a a size a say size just a I think it's fine to use u size and i size because unsigned size and signed size uh, or uh, integer size does make more sense I think that's that's fine we can keep that yeah so size um, capacity yeah, 
and then we need a pointer to like an owned an owned pointer basically <laughs> i'm very tempted to use uh like own pointer and do the serenity thing on purity uh <laughs> but that's not how that works um also maybe i can come up with a better name but that's basically what it is it's a pointer uh, or a reference in our case um to something that we own um oh wait no it's it's not a it, it needs to be a raw pointer um because we're doing like unsafe accesses or i guess it can be like a slice like an own slice um yeah so maybe we want something like Maybe we can just do do this uh, owned off a slice. That makes a lot of sense. Basically, if we if we do this, we're saying that owned off. We 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 can say that it's owned, and then inside that we have a reference type. For example, uh, I don't know. And 64 again that's a that's a heap allocated a 64-bit integer that we own this yeah i i like that so basically we have uh, this will be special cased of course because owned like this this heap allocation stuff needs to have language support but I think that's fine. Yeah, so we have <coughs> an own slice. So of course, like this slice thing is the size is not known. So it's not a sized type. So you can't just have it on the stack. Um, or maybe you can have it in like a local variable and we'll create an owned automatically for you. But I think it's no, it's more, it's better if we have that explicitly like owned always tells you, okay, here's something that is on the heap. And that way we don't lose uh, lose type safety uh, or memory safety. Okay, so vector. Let's let's write in any function. Um, a function. Uh, let's let's actually do something interesting here. So have type um, predicate function, and then we're going to use uh, a type argument on the type declaration. Uh, so basically, once we use that, we create that specific generic version of the type. So if you haven't noticed yet, generics here are basically C plus plus templates. Um, because that's just super simple to implement. Um, you just create a copy of the of everything and um, or at least everything you use in the beginning, probably everything, but uh, you know what I mean. Type predicate function of T is <coughs> it's a function that takes in a a value a T and returns a bool. So let's see. Now, of course, we have to give it this t explicitly. So remember, this t is fully independent of the vector t because this is outside the struct uh, declaration. So, yeah. <coughs> that will return a bool, of course. Now let's have a for loop. Um, except it's a nice for loop. Like, there's there's... Why am I putting brackets here? You don't need brackets around for loops. Um, for value in self. Forgot self. Um, element. Maybe. 
then we need the iterator and the iterator template and stuff. So for element itself, um, if predicate element, um, guess I'm borrowing the element. So this should be take a reference. Um, if predicate element, then return true. Otherwise, all right, now I can do this false. I'll just return false. Okay, um, let's think about iterators. Okay, so um, as you've seen, I want methods to be outside of the data definition. So to keep it consistent, again, orthogonality, I want interfaces to be outside of um, uh, outside of the uh, interface definitions as well. So interfaces are like, how do you get a dynamic function dispatch? They don't have data, but they have like functions and you uh, will generate a V table and do dynamic dispatch if necessary. Um, we might bind functions statically if we can determine, okay, we're only going to call this on this specific, uh, we're only going to call this specific implementation of the interface method so we can statically bind it. But in other cases, you'll get dynamic function dispatch um, as usual. Okay, public interface, interface iterator. So we need public, again, public method, iterator dot t, of course, dot um, next, which is, we can say an optional of t. And that would be rather simple because yeah, we can just tell, okay, if, if there's an actual value, we're not done yet. If there's no value, okay, the iterator is assumed to, uh, to be done. Yeah. I think that's like literally all the methods we need on, like we can, we can implement some of them. Like we can say iterator t count, we can do this uh, also, by the way. Uh, we can do this self. Then we can consume self here. I mean, yeah, we kind of consume the iterator. So which which means we need to be mutable. Uh, so next also uh, mutates the iterator state. So it needs to be mutable. Now the Rust keyword is nice. Yeah, let's let's keep the Rust keyword. I don't know. Why not? Um, count. That's a U size, and let's define the U size. Okay, so we can use U size here, and um, then we can just do. Uh, yeah, let's let's actually do this. What we're doing here implicitly, like calling next again and again. Um, just doing that explicitly, like var mutable variable um, current is um, is self the next. I think yeah, self the next while current I'm right, doing this while current is sum that's what we already have um yeah I'll, I'll probably be able to rewrite this in a more functional way later on but let's just do that for now mute count mute for count um
maybe I actually want like const at var. Wait, where do I have that? Yeah, let's actually put that in here. Let's actually use const and var. Let's let's be JavaScript like it. <laughs> I mean, it's not JavaScript. I'm just stealing syntax from JavaScript. Um, but I, it's very much not JavaScript, of course. Um, var current var count is zero, and now we need explicit type here. I think. No, wait, we don't because later on we will just return count. And then we can derive, okay, the return type is u size, so count needs to be u size, uh, which we can fixate up here because count doesn't have a type yet, or we only know that it is some integer type. That's by the, by the way what Rust also does, and I really like it because type inference is cool. I don't know. Um, anyways, we can just <laughs> count plus equals one. Here, uh, there, there's no plus plus because plus plus is ugly. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's, it's just ugly in general. Um, yeah, let's do that. And I'm at 50 minutes. Holy shit. Yeah, I think, I hope you, you get an idea of what I plan on powder to be. Um, basically I've written a bunch of trial code to figure out how the language should look what sort of features there are. It's very much, very much like Rust, but that's maybe because I like a lot of the ideas that are in Rust. Um, yeah, so as a final thing, let's commit all of these. Let's take uh, the readme, that's, I'll not commit that right now. Um, take all of these three. And also, before I forget, like dot attributes. That long trust. I think that's it. Um, okay, let me let me actually check that. Okay, it's linguist. Linguist language. It's not formal to forget attributes. That's correct. Um, so yeah, before we forget that, <laughs> just so that it, we get nice syntax or like kind of some syntax highlighting on uh, on GitHub. Um, there is a GitHub repository for this. It's in the description. Um, okay. Let's commit that. That's um, powder probably create some test files. I don't know. Um, catch out. We'll use the simple that powder for uh, the first process version. Okay, put that in, and with that, I'll say uh, enough for today. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for watch watching. This was much longer than I anticipated. Like I spent fifteen minutes rambling about shit. So hopefully that's interesting um, and hopefully I'll actually keep doing this, like uh, keep creating um, this thing because sometimes I get sidetracked. I don't know. Uh, one goal is also maybe that we get this to run on Serenity um, because as long as the, like, the LLVM compiler works on Serenity, which I think it does, so we should get this running on Serenity, which would be super cool. 
Um, I'll definitely put in some some features in the standard library that only work on Serenity. <laughs> uh, in either case, thank you all so much for watching. Code is on the GitHub in the description. Uh, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.